Welcome to The Free Will Show, a podcast that provides a beginner-friendly introduction to free will while also exploring cutting-edge developments on the topic. I'm Taylor Sear. And I'm Matt Flummer. In this episode, we talk with social psychologist Roy Baumeister about willpower and an effect that he calls ego depletion. We also ask Roy about his recent work developing a scientific theory of free will. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to introduce Roy Baumeister, who's professor of psychology at the University of Queensland and emeritus professor at Florida State University. Roy is incredibly prolific, having authored or co-authored hundreds of articles and many books, including the recent book, The Power of Bad, How the Negativity Effect Rules Us and How We Can Rule It, published uh, by Penguin in 2019. Uh, Some of the topics that Roy is interested in include self-control, decision-making, consciousness and free will, and and more. Um, On this last topic, Roy has co-edited a volume with one of our former guests, Alfred Neely. Uh, The volume is called Free Will and Consciousness, How Might They Work? And it was published in 2010 by Oxford Un- University Press. So welcome so, uh, to the show, Roy. Can you start by telling us a bit about yourself, your work, and how you came to be interested in working on issues like self-control, willpower, and other issues related to free will? Well, uh, it goes back a little while. Uh, I, uh, I went to college in the 70s thinking I would be a math major, and then I got a glimpse of higher math. I didn't want to do that. So it was the hippie <laughs> days. And I thought, well, I'll study religion and philosophy and uh, you know, learn about the grand questions and, and think big thoughts in life. <laughs> uh, and then my parents said, well, there's no money in that. You can't make a living. <laughs> uh, so they refused to pay. And so psychology was kind of a compromise. I had read uh, Sigmund Freud's uh, writings about morality. And instead of analyzing the concepts of right and wrong as a philosopher might, he, he looked, uh, well, how do people actually get their morals, uh, both in terms of the anthropological evidence, which was primitive back then, uh, and in terms of child development. So I thought, well, okay, this could work. You could tackle the big questions uh, using the scientific method. So I came into psychology um, with that interest and had the vague plan to roam through a number of the big philosophical questions and write a social science-based book and say, what can we do with this uh, from data? And so um, I had books on meaning of life and why is there evil and uh, and now I'm writing one scientific theory of free will. Um, In terms of getting into the self, well in the 70s uh, that was what everybody was talking about and the hippies were taking drugs to learn about themselves. (laughs) Uh, But the the researchers were also uh, trying to understand self and identity and uh, how does this, this come about. So uh, I kind of embraced that uh, with the zeitgeist that this would be a good um, project for me to do. And uh, I, th- I think I'm getting near the end now. I have a book in press uh, on the self uh, that uh, tries to pull together what I've learned from my own and from lots of other people's work over the last 40 years. Um, and then in the 1980s, well, I, I studied different aspects of the self you know, self esteem and self presentation so on. Uh, some of the smartest people in the 80s were saying self-regulation, close cousin to self-control, that this is not mm-hmm. one more thing. This is the key to everything about the self. So I thought, well, I better learn about that. <laughs> uh, I set out to read the research literature, uh, wrote an early book uh, called Losing Control, um, just summarizing what we got from it. Back then, there wasn't that much work directly on uh, self-regulation, self-control. Uh, there were studies of how people tried to quit smoking and keep their diets mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So made the best I could out of that. Um, since then, the research has really taken off and there's a lot more uh, to cover now. But you know, that's how I got started in it. Uh, in terms of free will, well, w- one thing in that Losing Control book, I said, well, it kind of looks like uh, your ability to control yourself is a limited energy resource. It seems like after you've used it on one thing, you don't do as well with something else. And mm-hmm. you know, people are coping with stress at work. They're more likely to relapse on smoking or drinking or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it looked like it's a limited resource. Now, at the time, this was a radical idea because back then all the theories about the self were the, the, the mind is a, is a little computer and so it's information processing. 
And mm -hmm. that would predict the opposite result because if your yeah. computer, you've already loaded the self-control program, then you have another self-control task, you'll be faster at it. So it should improve. Uh, but we started finding the opposite, uh, consistent with what I observed in the literature. Um, um, and so that became a big thing and, and uh, one of the theories about self-control. And at one point, I was writing a chapter on, on the self, and I sort of realized, well, there's the executive function, the part of the self that does things, that takes action. Uh, and so self-control is part of that, but so is making choices and making decisions. So we included in a couple of studies, uh, well, would self-control or would decision-making use the same resource as self-control? Would this you know, depletion effect uh, go one way or the other? Um, and this, uh, I said, this was the most suspense I had about my own research, the most I held my breath since any study <laughs> I did since I got tenure. Uh, and it did, it worked. And, and later we did a whole series of those. Um, so that made me able to say that Self-control and rational decision-making have some common psychological substrate. Uh, that's when I thought, well, you know, this resource would already be important if it were just about self-control, given the importance of self-control. But given that it also pertains to rational choice, uh, this is something big. And maybe this is what uh, free will is, uh, uh, or maybe it contains some insights into free will. And I, I knew the philosophy books used examples from self-control, and examples from rational decision making, but philosophers had no way to say that, that these are related, these are the same thing. Uh, and this is one of the advantages of interdisciplinary collaboration. I mean, the philosophers mm -hmm. think through things much better, uh, in much clearer, sharper theories than we do in, in psychology, but we can collect data to sort of study how causal processes work. Um, so that made me able to show that, that those things are linked. Um, Subsequent work has linked them also to planning uh, and to initiative, as in active rather than passive responding. So for me, that's the psychological quartet of, of, of free will, uh, self-control, decision-making, especially rational decision-making, planning, uh, and uh, um, initiative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, most of our guests have been professional philosophers. As a psychologist, you've kind of already mentioned how you were already interested in these philosophical questions and a little bit about working with philosophers. So can you say a little bit more about coming to work with philosophers and like the, the process and how you, how, what your experiences are with working with philosophers on these philosophical concepts? Uh, yes. I think the first time when I got interested in this and, and thought maybe philosophers would be interested, uh, our friend Al Mealy invited me to give a small talk at one of his conferences. And so I thought, well, I'd better explain things very basically because, you know, you talk to your own field, people are all up on it. Um, so I was giving a simple introduction and a couple of them raised their hands and pointed out very specific things. <laughs> Obviously, they were very well read uh, on, this, uh, uh, on this and what we were doing as well. So, I, OK, well, I don't have to start from uh, from zero. These are uh, mm -hmm. pretty smart people uh, and, and already pretty well informed. Um, so uh, that was stimulating. Um, I got to know Al Mealy and we, we became one of my best friends in uh, well, the time I was at Florida State and you know, we were still in touch uh, with Zoom. Um, so uh, the, the discipline and care with which philosophers think through all careful things, uh, that really struck me. I remember back when I was a student reading Kant too. I mean, my parents were very smart, but they used their intelligence to rationalize what they wanted to believe. <laughs> reading Kant and saying, well, he doesn't do that. Uh, uh, if, you know, he's using the, he wants to get to the right answer, whether he likes it or not. And I had the same experience with, uh, with Al, I would bring up some evidence in favor of something that we kind of agreed on and say, well, here's another piece of evidence for it. And he would say, no, no, that's not valid evidence. And he would point out the flaws in it. <laughs> yeah. so that, that's good. I, you know, I like being explo exposed to, uh, people who think in that disciplined of fashion. Um, mm -hmm. Philosophers, there is a different emphasis. Uh, philosophers focus on the borderline cases and, you know, mm -hmm. and debate those uh, 
uh, with uh, great care. Uh, psychology, we're fine with fuzzy sets because we can go to the prototype uh, case uh, and uh, you know and, and do studies, collect data, uh, and, and uh, advance the field that way. I think the two are good for each other. Uh, you know, the philosophy is often classed in the humanities. And I think it doesn't really belong in the humanities. It, it really belongs in the social sciences. Uh, in a way, you could say almost philosophy is to the social sciences the, what mathematics is to the natural sciences. Hmm. It's sort of a common conceptual language that you can use to improve stuff. And so whenever I've had a chance to interact with uh, philosophers, they always uh, um, been been a helpful and beneficial thing. And I, I, I think both fields could... Uh, a benefit from further interactions, but um, certainly we can benefit uh, from the careful thinking that, uh, that, that philosophers have, because we aren't trained to uh, analyze things in that in that kind of disciplined way. And you know, mm-hmm. worrying about the the borderline cases again—that's perhaps not such a uh, an issue to us. Uh, I told mm-hmm. an impression to. Uh, to me, Lee, one time, and he, he he laughed at this. I said, "Well, if you have a theory that's you know true a lot of the time and and works, and there are some uh, well defined exceptions and some things it doesn't apply to, but it works pretty well in in social science. You have the basis for a long successful career. In philosophy, you're just wrong." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's <laughs> funny. Yeah. It's great to hear uh, psychologists say that they, the two disciplines need each other and that there's room for good interdisciplinary work. And part of the thing we're excited about with this season of the Free Will Show is we're seeing how much interdisciplinary work there is on the topic of free will. And it, I think it's a good model for other areas of philosophy, too. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we want to talk a bit about willpower and ego depletion, which you've already alluded to in some of your answers. But um, what do you, what do you think it means to exercise willpower? And could you give some examples of the sort of thing you have in mind using that term willpower? All right, we're very slow to adopt the term willpower. Uh, psychologists are, are skittish about borrowing terms from popular discourse because they come with a lot of baggage. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I finally figured out it. They decided that it, it is pretty much the same concept that people use. Uh, so the term power. It means that there's a sort of energy uh, to it. Um, and sometimes call it the, the, the strength model as well. Uh, and I think the intuitive sense comes from, well, you have a strong temptation to do something you shouldn't, so you need at least an equal strength of character or some kind of power inside you to make you resist that, uh, to override it. And self-control at its basis uh, is to change yourself, to override a response. Um, so you have you could be changing your your thoughts, as in making yourself concentrate, or uh, shutting that annoying song out of your mind, or shutting that annoying ex romantic partner out of your mind. Um, or it can be controlling your feelings, as in trying to feel better, trying to manage your anger, whatever. Um, tr- controlling your uh, uh, impulse control. Uh, that's the one people are most familiar with. Uh, and it's not just uh, food and cigarettes and alcohol and other things, but controlling aggressive impulses or uh, sexual impulses, uh, You know, not all of which should be indulged, probably. Um, and then the last would be task performance, making yourself uh, continue working when you feel like mm-hmm. quitting, trading off speed versus accuracy, um, making yourself do your best, that sort of thing. Um, so all these involve overriding some natural tendency or, or, or some other impulse uh, and making yourself do better. And to me, that's one important step toward freedom, since we're on a free will podcast, uh, because most animals, the animal brain is designed to do what you have the strongest impulse to do right now, and yet we can resist that and override it, even based on thinking that, well, I want to do it now, but next week I'll be sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's a very advanced thing. You have to project into the future, mm-hmm. analyze the contingencies there, including what other people will think of you, and then bring that calculation back into the present and use it to alter your behavior. Um, 
So um, I'm wandering around a little bit here, uh, but does that answer the question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. So you've used uh, the, like this muscle model of willpower and you've mentioned this already. Can you say a little bit more about what it means for willpower to be like a muscle? Right. Uh, there are three components to the analogy. Uh, first, um, like a muscle, when you use it, it gets tired. So that's the basic ego depletion effect, which I think uh, determined recently is possibly the best replicated effect in social psychology, um, which is not to say that it always works. Social psychology is having trouble with <laughs> replication, <laughs> uh, but uh, ego depletion is very strong. So after you use self-control in one task, uh, you don't do as well at the next task because you just like if you're um, working in the yard all day and then you go inside and are supposed to uh, carry some boxes upstairs or whatever, well, your your muscles are tired. So that's one effect. Um, the second effect is that this fatigue, whether in your muscle or in your, your willpower, uh, it's not that you're out of energy just kind of the naive thing we first thought. It's not that the energy is all gone, but rather the mind uh, naturally conserves energy long before uh, it, it runs out. Now, there is a point with your muscles at which they just won't work anymore, mm -hmm. uh, but you feel tired long before that. Mm -hmm. The exercise people and the sports psychologists find, however, that if you have to, you're able to exert maximum pressure just as much your muscle can do just as much work when it's tired. The tiredness is a signal to start conserving energy. So your, your brain sort of manufactures that, but it does that long before uh, the muscle is in a state where it won't function anymore. And it's the same uh, with with self-control and, and willpower. There's wonderful studies by my, my former student and current protege and friend, uh, Mark Moravin, uh, showed that if people anticipate more demands on their willpower, they're sort of skimp on what they do now. Um, if they uh, if they exert self control and they're depleted, so akin to being the muscles being tired, well mm -hmm. then if you if you make it some really important, uh, then they can perform just fine. But then you test them on something else, and then they're really depleted. And the same with <laughs> yeah. muscle, uh, if you know you work. Use the example, worked in the yard all day and your muscles were tired. And then your partner said, I need these boxes upstairs, but it's really important. You have to get them there or, you know, well then, yeah, you can do it. But then you're that much more tired. So that the very interesting, it, it's conservation, not exhaustion of the resource. Yeah. And the third analogy to a muscle uh, is that uh, when you exercise it regularly, it gets stronger. Uh, that, uh, yeah, after you work out, you're your muscles are tired, but if you work out every day, uh, you know, gradually your muscles will, will become more capable. And uh, this is the one I actually had the most trouble um, replicating. Um, we, we found it a bunch of times and we didn't find it a bunch of times. Of course, you have to tell people to go home and do these exercises and we don't know if they actually do them. Right. Uh, it worked at at one university where I was at, um, at, at Florida State, I think, you know, you guys were there. It's more of a party school. <laughs> yeah, 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 but I don't think they really did the exercises. So it didn't work as well there, but it's worked plenty of other places. And now there are several meta-analyses uh, recently published, another in press, uh, showing that, yes, if people do the exercises regularly for even just two or three weeks, uh, that their self-control becomes stronger and the, uh, and the, the tests of self-control are completely unrelated uh, to the exercises they did. So it's just one, one core muscle that you use for everything. Um, so like one of the studies, uh, they had people work on saving money. Um, and uh, these were students with money problems and the experimenter met with them over a couple months to make plans and keep track of how they were doing, managing their money. Uh, but then they tested them in the lab on, can you concentrate and keep track when a bunch of um, um, 
squares are moving around the com the computer screen. Can you keep track? So that's managing your attention. We had to do this uh, while there was a TV comedy playing right next to it, so it was very distracting. So you had to force yourself to attend to one thing and not attend to something else. They also reported that. Uh, they just remember working on their money with this, but they reported at the end they were less likely to leave the dishes stacked in the sink after dinner. Uh, their study habits got better. They even ate better, healthier food, which goes against it because junk food is often cheaper uh, than than healthy food. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, unbeknownst to them, it, or, or, uh, it wasn't something they were seriously thinking about. But when you ask them, they. They did show better self-control in a variety of spheres of life, just from working, uh, just from working on the one. Anyway, that apparently uh, is uh, is sound and is replicated in multiple places, and it is what wise men and women have recommended throughout the ages that uh, mm -hmm. you know, practice habits of self-discipline, and you will be a stronger person. Building character, as the Victorians used to call it, and it, it really does seem to work. Yeah, interesting. Well, for listeners that want to read more about this, there's this widely cited paper of yours called Ego Depletion, Is the Active Self a Limited Resource? And I don't know if we've used the term ego depletion already, but that's the term you've given to this idea of um, willpower uh, being like a muscle and uh, sort of wearing down over time. Um, do you want to say anything more about that term ego depletion? Or were there any studies that you wanted to talk about um, that are relevant to showing something about ego depletion and willpower. Well, yeah, I can describe one of the studies from that that paper. You know, at this point, there are something like six hundred published studies in the in the research literature. Uh, the term uh, we started getting this, what at the time was a radical idea that the self was partly made of this this energy. Mm -hmm. And as I said, you know, back in the nineties, everything was in information processes. As it, as it turned out. Psychology then went biological and started, and, and that made it much more receptive to this idea. I mean, life itself is an energy process. So uh, energy became something we, we could talk about. Uh, but uh, at the time it was radical. And so I was looking through people who had written about the self. There are many theories of the self. And nobody had mentioned energy since uh, Sigmund Freud going back back to the, it was the 1920s. So... Uh, as a kind of homage to uh, Freud, we adopted his term ego, uh, mm -hmm. depleting uh, and the depletion. It, it turns out depletion has two different means. One meanings. One is that it's all gone, and one is it's just somewhat gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's led to some unfortunate confusion. It's clear that you you don't run out of energy, and especially we had some studies uh, tying it into the body's energy system. I can give. We give people a dose of glucose, which is the, the chemical in the bloodstream that carries energy uh, to the muscles and the brain and everything else. Um, we found if we gave people a dose of glucose after they were depleted, it helped them recover uh, from the depletion effect. Uh, so, this, And that's worked very consistently for us. Um, so just to describe one of the early studies from that 98 paper, um, Oh, and let me also say, yeah, it's fine if people want to read that. That's a, a good way to start. Uh, sure. There was a, a book, uh, Willpower, that I wrote with uh, John Tierney as a New York Times science writer. And uh, um, that came somewhat later and summarized a lot of the other research. So people who aren't really interested in all the details of lab procedures, I'd, I'd sort of recommend starting with that. It'll give you a nice mm -hmm. overview. And that stuff yeah. is... Uh, there are one or two new things, uh, ideas I had since then, but it, it's a pretty good coverage. But like one of the early studies, uh, this was a Diane Tice's idea, uh, was uh, we would bring people into the lab and have uh, like a bowl of chocolates and a bowl of radishes and, and said, well, you're going to be in the radish condition and you have to eat, eat the radishes and, ma and make them use their self-control to resist the chocolate. Uh, so we, we essentially did a, a version of that. Uh, we had people skip lunch. You know, you can't tell people the study's going to measure your self-control because then they get all weird about it. So you have to, okay. what we called it, cover story. So we said, well, studying how well people can remember tastes. That's not it. And said, because of that, we need, you need to skip, uh, not eat for three meals before the experiment. So they get there, they're hungry. And then 
I guess this part was a little mean. We we baked chocolate chip cookies in the lab. <laughs> and, uh, you know how it blows out the smell. And, oh, it was a wonderful, delicious aroma through the lab. <laughs> we got it because we got complaints from people across the hall saying, I'm trying to do my statistics. I'm smelling your cookies all day. <laughs> so it was very tempting. Well, anyway, the person comes to our experiment and, you know, is hungry and it smells very good. And then sits at the table and there's a tray of these cookies and some chocolates and all that very tempting um and then this bowl of radishes uh and so you know some we told to eat the cookies and and some we did with no food at all just to see if there's an effect there uh, but the ones we're interested are the ones we said well you're gonna we, you need to eat the radishes and, and don't touch the cookies there for other other people in the experiment um so uh, you need to eat a, eat some cookie, eat some radishes. And then we left them alone for a few minutes to maximize the temptation. Uh, of course, we didn't trust them, so we secretly observed them. And they, they were tempted. They looked longingly at the cookies and things like that. But nobody actually bit into the forbidden food, and everybody managed to eat a, <laughs> at least the better part of one radish. Um, and then uh, in a different room with no food, uh, you know, in a neutral uh, situation, then we uh, a procedure we borrowed from stress research, which is how long do you keep trying uh, to solve something before you give up? Because that mm-hmm. you know it's frustrating and not getting anywhere. Uh, so the impulse is to just to just quit, uh, but you got to make yourself keep trying. And and sure enough, uh, the people in the radish condition quit much faster uh, than the people uh, in the uh, in the other two conditions. So. Resisting that temptation took something out of them, uh, making yourself, and, and it was a good self-control test because you both had to inhibit the desire for the cookies, and most people don't like radishes that much, so they had to make themselves eat the radishes. Now, you've heard people over time say, I like radishes, and I guess I sort of do too, but when you've got your nose full of chocolate cookies, <laughs> the radishes are really unappetizing, so they had to do both. But doing that, it was a so a clear clearly challenging act of self-control. Um, and that uh, took something out of them that they didn't have to draw on when they were then struggling with the, uh, uh, the unsolvable puzzles. Uh, we didn't tell them they're unsolvable, of course, uh, but yeah. it would mess up the experiment if they actually solved it. So uh, <laughs> we had to use ones that were, were technically impossible. So we had a lot of other procedures and so on, but th- there you get the idea that doing one self-control task had a, measurable, discernible uh, failure on, uh, on or a drop in performance on, on a completely different self-control task that came shortly thereafter. I can't help but think of the practical application of your research. Um, where you've talked about the willpower is like a muscle, so if you work it out, you get better at it. And you've also talked about being ego depleted, and so you get, a, get something with some sugar in it. Um, it helps you to be stronger in your willpower. Um, what what other kinds of things have you noticed that are like directly practical, applicable for people who are like, oh yeah, I want to be a better person. I want to be able to withstand these temptations and quit smoking or quit eating sweets or whatever. All right. Um, well, self control can be improved through exercise, so that's probably the best way. The, the building character. Uh, I say. I, I'm often asked around New Year's, what about New Year's resolutions? Why do people Mm -hmm. do so badly at them? But they're all self-improvement ones, or most of them, and they all take willpower to do it. So when you're trying to change your life for the better in five different ways, you put the energy into one and it takes away from another. Now, I don't want to say not to make resolutions because I believe in (laughs) (laughs) self-improvement. But uh, what I suggest is... uh, line them up in order of difficulty and start with the easiest one and just do that until you succeed at that. That will strengthen the muscle and then move on to the next one. So start with something simple. Uh, You're going to improve your posture or you're going to not swear in front of the children or wash the dishes after dinner rather than leaving the dishes in the sink. Just a few simple things like that. Uh, And then the bigger ones like quitting smoking or taking up jogging or something, leave those till later. Also do them at a time when you're not having other demands on your willpower. Everything uh, that you do, uh, or a lot of things that you do, uh, will place 
place demands on it. And if you're in a really difficult time at work, or if you're having a ongoing battles with your romantic partner and moving toward divorce, well, that's not a time to undertake self-improvement. That's going to take all your energy resources uh, just to cope with that. But when you're to some extent at peace with the world, you know, that might be a good time then to uh, pick up the next one of your resolutions and try to uh, pursue um, self-improvement. Um, food works. Uh, the, the sugar thing is funny. We discovered it in a, a study where we gave people ice cream and it, and, and it worked in uh, Florida State. Then we went on to using uh, lemonade because uh, you can mix lemonade with either diet sweetener or sugar, and it tastes about equally good. Mm-hmm. People like it. It's hot in the South. Um, and you could do it totally double blind, have everything mixed before people come in so the experimenter doesn't know, the subject doesn't know. Yeah. Uh, which is, So that was a, a very elegant way of doing it. Um, but, of course, people want to use their self-control to resist sugar <laughs> a lot of the time. Yeah. <laughs> so I say, what I say is don't try this at home. I'm, in the lab, we just have people for a short time. So sugar is a very fast acting thing. You get a quick up and a quick down. But if you're you know, going to do heavy thinking for all afternoon, like a philosopher or, uh, or whatever kind of work or accountant or businessman, um, you probably want something with a better glycemic index. You know, you want protein that you can burn over a long period of time that you won't go up and, and, and crash. So eating well is a good thing. Sleeping. Uh, it's harder to do studies with sleeping, especially if you want to have people spend the night in the laboratory. It's very expensive in terms of mm-hmm. paying them and paying the help and doing everything else. Uh, but uh, from some of our experience sampling studies where we follow people around, it's clear that bad sleep and poor self-control cause each other. There's sort of a, a mm-hmm. downward spiral. Uh mm-hmm. And uh, it's more the quality of sleep than the quantity is is what we found. We didn't have the, the strongest measures. We had people estimate how long they uh, they slept, and so maybe that wasn't there. But but bad sleep um, makes you more likely to feel depleted the next day, and then feeling depleted uh, is more likely to impair your sleep uh, on the next day. Another thing we found in that that has a huge effect is interpersonal conflict. In the laboratory work, we depleted self-control usually by having people do it, self-control task. Or when we started doing decision-making too, we had them make a bunch of, of um, choices, and that also then led to poorer self-control. But in, in daily life, uh, the item was just we asked people, have you had a, uh, a, a interpersonal conflict in the last 24 hours? And you know, it could be with your your spouse or your kids or your uh, colleagues at work or somebody on the bus or whatever. Um, but boy, uh, <laughs> again, that went both ways. Uh, yeah. Being depleted and, makes you, and having poor self-control as a trait also make you have a lot more of those conflicts. And then those conflicts are themselves draining. Mm-hmm. Right? You start to see how in life, um, the people with poor self-control, you know, will sort of get themselves into trouble. Mm. There's there an interesting question when we, you know, first we did the depletion work. So that's the situation. That's what in psychology we, we call a state, that your your state of willpower is low. And then we thought, well, is there a personality trait? It seems obvious some people have better self-control than others. And so Tangney and I developed a, a trait scale, which has also performed very, very well. It's been cited thousands of times. Um so it sorts people high or low self-control. So how do they fit together? Who is more likely to get depleted in the laboratory? Is it the person with high self-control who has farther down to fall? Or is it the person who has low self-control who doesn't have much, you know, might fall apart? Well, we've studied this in a, multiple studies, and now there are several giant data sets also. And there's no difference. In the lab, um, they get depleted at the same amount. However, when we looked out at the world and following people through their daily lives, people with low self-control had a lot more depletion that they reported. Mm. So what's the difference? Well, in the lab, everyone does the same task. And so then it's equally depleting Mm -hmm. to them. But out in the world, 
people with low self-control lead, lead screwed up lives and they make more problems for them. Like they miss paying, paying the bill by the deadline and then, you know, something gets canceled and then they have to cope with that. They have more conflicts with their romantic partners, which then, you know, end up sleeping on the couch and not sleeping as well. Uh, or, uh, or you just, you know, or when you get mad, you say something that you don't mean, and then you have to undo that. I mean, it creates new problems. So in people with low self-control, it's really how they live their lives that cause them to be a lot more depleted, even though if they did exactly the same thing as a person with high self-control, they would just get depleted to the same amount. Yeah, very interesting. You mentioned earlier about the replication problems in psychology, and you've, you've also mentioned that some of your results have been, um, you've had success in replicating them. Um, have, have any of your studies, you've had difficulty or other labs have difficulty? Um, some labs have it and some don't. I, I've just been looking at, you know, the latest thing is to do these multi-site investigations where you get 10 or 20 laboratories to all do the same thing. And those are, those fail at almost everything. You know, hmm. we have, uh, we have a big sample of, I think, all the ones that have been done that I'm just reviewing, and I think 18% of them worked to some degree. Wow. Um, and I think that's a reflection that social psychology is much more dependent on the context, on getting the person involved. The signs of poor involvement are there because they, they preset the criteria that, well, all right, if the person doesn't do this, we'll delete their data from there. And then they end up deleting a third of their sample which means mm -hmm. they aren't getting the instructions across. Mm -hmm. um, and so in replication, we need to distinguish something that basically fails to, that falsifies the hypothesis from something where they fail to manipulate the independent variable. Because that, if you, if you don't manipulate the independent variable, then you're not testing the hypothesis. Yeah. So one of the earliest ones of these multi-site ones was on ego depletion and it found nothing. Uh, but it failed to manipulate the independent variable. The people weren't more fatigued. They were, they were frustrated because it was kind of an annoying procedure. Yeah. It was a weird procedure anyway. Uh, it's unfortunate they chose that. Um, but somebody went back through their data when they, when they made them public um, and said, well, let's look at the extent to which people did report being fatigued in the depletion condition by this. And for them, it, it worked significantly. So although it was publicized as a failure to replicate, it actually was a success. Now, I come to the conclusion from doing this review that ego depletion is the currently the best replicated effect in social psychology because it has something like 600, well, five years ago, it had 600 published significant findings supporting it and basically none in the opposite direction. So it's yeah. not... Sometimes they say, well, maybe there are thousands of unpublished studies that found nothing in their own. But you, you get, you know, if it's just chance, it would go equally in both directions. You've got mm -hmm. 600 of those. You have pre-registered uh, ones that some people in Texas did where you say in advance you're going to do exactly this and analyze it this way and get this much data from these many people. So there's there's no, your hands are tied about it. And, and that worked significantly. So it has support from that. It has a bunch of real world things like... Uh, you know, later in the day, hospital workers don't wash their hands as much uh, as they yeah. do in the morning, even though the procedure is to wash their, their hands every every patient. Uh, also, I think physicians are more likely to prescribe antibiotics uh, late in the day when they're depleted. There was a study with parole judges that uh, um, as the day wears on, they're more just, I'll send them all back to prison. Um, <laughs> the real world things. And then, and then the multi-site one, there are three on ego depletion. One was a solid success. The other two, like the one I had a mixed success, it was initially reported as a failure, but when you reanalyze the data, to the extent it worked, uh, it did support it. And then there was another recent one uh, that, that found the same thing and it found, it made a difference with the thousand subjects that they d deleted based on their criteria. And they had no idea they were gonna, you know, a third of the sample was gonna be thrown out. Um, so it worked, I think, if you kept them all in and it, it, uh, it dropped below significance if you didn't, although the effect size was basically the same in both. So I'd call that a mixed success. Anyway, there's nothing else in social psychology that has that those four 
uh, support possibly there's a attitude change uh, persuasion model that does pretty well. That would be the one, the one competitor for it. Mm. Um, so, uh, do people fail to get ego depletion? Sure, uh, I know some who who can't find it. Um, many people say, well, it, it took a little practice. You have to get the person involved and to do it. You can't just read them the instructions and leave them alone and do it. They, they have to put in the effort to change themselves, to override their, uh, their response. And if they do that, if you get them to do that, then it seems to work pretty reliably. Uh, but some don't get them to, uh, to do that. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's an issue for the field as a whole. The mm-hmm. cognitive psychologists who study, uh, you know, mental processes, you know, like memory and attention, their stuff, they also have replication problems, but overall they do better uh, than the social ones. But I think maybe it's more basic aspects of the mind uh, that, uh, that travel better. Uh, the social ones seem to depend more on the person's involvement and the, the social mm-hmm. context and, uh, um, it's it's an issue the field's going to struggle with. I, I, right. I'm not sure our solutions yeah. are, are. I'm not sure the cure is better than the disease. <laughs> uh, right, but uh, we'll see where that goes. Well, we you mentioned this book you're working on uh, earlier, scientific theory of free will, and I wanted to give you a chance to mention any new projects you're working on. So, would you want to preview that book on free will, or would you want to talk about something else? Well, I can talk about that. Uh, I notice uh, in the literature there's sort of this ongoing view that, well, if you believe in science, you can't accept free will, um, that it's unscientific. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I thought having a scientific theory of free will out there will at least put a stop to that silly argument. <laughs> you know, they can argue, uh, argue against it on, on other ways. You know, and when the ego depletion work got going and like I said, when it, it turned out that the same resource was used for decision making and, and planning and active initiative, uh, that's when I started talking about free will and I got involved with in free will debates and I followed many of them. Um, what the philosophers debate is not really the right thing job for psychologists. Um, so uh, we can't do an experiment to prove that somebody could have acted differently in the same mm-hmm. situation. Yeah. Um, but we can, as I said, show some of these processes uh, that make human behavior freer than, than chimpanzees. What I realized after being in these debates for some years is in many, many sense, they're just a semantic debate uh, that the people who are against free will and the people who are in favor of it mostly agree about how behavior is caused and they also agree, and this is a crucial thing, that the human behavior causing system, the human agency in the brain, is qualitatively different from what any other animal has. Mm-hmm. They just disagree about whether it deserves to be called free will. So I'm going to say, I think, you know, we might as well use the term. Maybe we should use it a bit ironically. Actually, for me, the and, and Al Mealy kind of taught me this too, the, the will part is more problematic than the free part. Because we don't have a will that we talk about in psychology, but mm-hmm. given the history, I think maybe we should use the term with a mm-hmm. sort of irony. Um, but the thing, the scientific problem is explain this new kind of agency. How did it evolve? Well, the people who are against free will, a lot of them think it means causation by a soul or uh, exemption from causality, anything like that. Mm-hmm. But I agree with them. I don't believe in those things either. So I agree with them. The people who do believe in free will talk about decision-making processes and self-control and all that. Well, I agree with them, uh, mm-hmm. with them too. I think a scientific theory would be a causal. So there's nothing supernatural. There's nothing outside of causal. And science theories are causal theory. It has to be compatible with evolution. Um, another point uh, would be that... Uh, uh, many people debate yes or no, if people have free will or not. Uh, but in psychology, most things are on a continuum. Mm-hmm. Right. And so if we talk about uh, the de- 
the term degrees of freedom has a mm -hmm. statistical meaning, but you know, some acts are freer than others. Everybody can relate to that. And our, we did an experiment some years ago where we asked people, describe from your own life an experience where you acted of your own free will and describe another one where you acted not of your own free will. And nobody said, oh, I can't do that, or I don't know what you mean, or I don't have any free will. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was able to furnish one of each type of story, uh, and they were systematically different. So this is something in daily experience, it's something important in society as well. Um, I mean, my basis of my thinking the last 20 years or so uh, is that the traits that make us human, that set us apart from other? I mean, yes, we are animals. Yes, we evolved and so on. But we're more than animals. We're different. And the traits that set us apart, that define our humanity, are essentially adaptations for culture. The culture is our strategy to solve survival and reprodu reproduction, the basic biological challenges that every species has to solve. Uh, and so free will would be prominent among those. And looking at it that way, the, the, the properties of free will are likely adapted to what will be good in a social system. I mean, philosophers emphasize moral responsibility uh, is very intricately linked to, to the uh, concept of free will. Uh, well, uh, a, system, a social system where people have moral responsibility is going to work better in terms of survival and reproduction than a system where people don't. So I would look at it as an adaptation for that. Emphasize a couple other things too. I mean, we have economic systems and other, other species don't. And again, that takes a new kind of agency to understand quantification and has to project in the future. I mean, there's no point in buying something if you're not going to have it unless you're going to eat it right away. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, you know, the extension across time is a huge advance in the human mind compared with uh, um, other creatures. Anyway, these are some of the things I'll be uh, addressing in the book. But I thought we could nice. just pull all this together and at least say, say, if there's free will, this is what it is. If there's not, this right. is what is mistaken for it. Yeah. But mm -hmm. very implausible that there's free will that doesn't involve decision-making and self-control and, mm -hmm. and all these psychological right. processes. Thanks. That sounds really interesting. Where do you predict that there will be interesting developments or what areas of science do you think would be most fruitful for philosophers interested in free will to explore? Well, my, my fond hope is that when I start laying out some of the scientific things about the nuts and bolts of how free will works, that uh, philosophers can find that uh, something further to uh, uh, explore and, yeah. and develop. Uh, um, that'd be nice, but who knows? <laughs> um, it's hard for me to give marching orders to people in a different discipline. Mm. I mean, your question would be hard enough if I if you even asked what would psychologists do next uh, in right. of, uh, um, of these topics. Um, so I don't know enough about the politics of ideas and uh, <laughs> philosophy as to say where where things would go. Um, I guess I don't have anything intelligent to say about that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. No, that's good. No, I like the, I like the modesty there, the, the <laughs> humility about not giving marching orders. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Roy. Uh, where can listeners go to follow your work? Oh, um, I guess there's a webpage, uh, RoyBaumeister.com. Mm -hmm. um, other people maintain it for me. Uh, I don't know quite how to do it, but I think they're doing a, a decent job and mm -hmm. uh, update it periodically. Um, there are various podcasts and things online. I uh, uh, if you just do a search, uh, I, I think it will show up. Um, a lot of my best work for listeners would be in, in the books I've written. So uh, mm -hmm. um, if there's a, a book on a topic that uh, interests someone, um, please check it out. Uh, and for the uh, ones who are going to get into the weeds and take it apart, well, then the, the journal articles. Uh, um, that's the uh, original science. Um, I have... I have 
sort of two scientific careers. One is as a data collector, which I'm winding down now as I, I, I get older. Uh, the other is is where I review lots of other people's work um, and literature reviews. I kind of stumbled on that early in my career, which is a good method for someone who has generalist interests and uh, mm -hmm. because it's really hard to collect data on different topics. It's a new set of skills every time. If yeah. I want to go study aggression, I have to learn how to do aggression research or mm -hmm. helping. I'd have to learn the procedures for that. But reviewing the literature, I can go into an area and read a couple hundred papers and uh, look for patterns and size them up. So uh, I've been doing that and that's, that's uh, probably what I'm going to emphasize but going forward. You address the bigger issues. And yeah. uh, as I said, I'm interested in tackling some of the big philosophical problems from social science uh, mm -hmm. basis. Uh, so that's going to be done more with uh, reading and synthesizing the work other people have done uh, rather than collecting data myself. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, thanks so much for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. It's been really okay. interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. good. No, well, thanks for you. Thanks yeah. to you. And thanks for having me on. Yeah. In our next episode, we'll talk about developmental psychology and free will, and our guest will be Tamar Kushner, professor of psychology and neuroscience at Duke University.